Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here uh, with all of you today. Um, and I'd like to uh, kind of give a quick overview on some of the ideas that we've been working on uh, through the DM journey. Um, I mean, this is a space that over the last few years has seen an explosion in interest and in activity. Uh, when we designed the MIT Digital Currency Experiment, this was in 1314. Uh, as you can see on this map, the Google Trends for some of the keywords uh, was, was kind of flat. Um, it's gone through different waves. And I think in parallel with kind of a rising interest in cryptocurrencies and blockchain, there's also been a rise in interest in, in CBDCs. Um, I mean, part of this was probably accelerated by uh, the first version of our white paper uh, in the summer uh, of 2020 um, and, and kind of the reaction to, to what, you know, I've described as a very naive first version of the DM uh, vision. But taking a step back, I think what's really interesting, and I see Joshua Gans on the call today, my co-author on this piece, is that you know at, at, at its art, blockchain technology really allows for new forms of market design. Uh, this is you know really driven by a reduction in two fundamental costs that the technology reduces. Uh, what we call the cost of verification. That one is very intuitive. Uh, essentially, the cost of verifying that digital information is accurate and 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 kind of up to date. Uh, and the cost of networking. Uh, so for the lack of a better term, we really kind of connect this to the ability to bootstrap a digital ecosystem without assigning control and market power to a centralized intermediary. So maybe a better way to talk about the cost of networking is really about interoperability. These are new types of networks that are highly interoperable and on top of that can be programmed uh, to perform different functions. I think we've seen this uh, before, uh, our kind of interoperability has driven a wave of innovation um, in a number of different services with the internet. Uh, but what's happening with cryptocurrencies is that to some extent, this combination of interoperability and programmability is, is going through a number of different verticals. You have decentralized finance applications, which are essentially taking interoperability to financial markets and allowing a number of digital assets to trade and be exchanged in other forms. Uh, you have a similar uh, type of change happening in the creative industries and digital content with NFTs or non-fungible tokens. And all of these are kind of following a very similar narrative of removing intermediaries from the picture or changing more precisely the nature of intermediation in financial services, payments, and, and of course, also in the digital distribution of content online. Now, one of the challenges with the removal of intermediaries is that, of course, intermediaries play a very important role in society. Uh, often, you know, they're the carriers of society's values and principles. And so in a piece with Zaim Asari from Davis Polk, for example, we highlight how DeFi will need to reconcile some of the capabilities of the technology with the ability to regulate markets, ensure, you know, that insiders don't exploit uh, information that they have access to or try to manipulate the market to their own advantage. Uh, a number of protections that we come to enjoy in traditional financial systems, but haven't been ported back um, in, in the cryptocurrencies and blockchain space. At its core, you know, you may think that this is a technology, it, it's just another instance of software eating the world, um, but really there's a crucial interplay here between code, software, and complementary institutions coming and, and kind of allowing the technology to really reach its full potential. Now, there's a number of key long-term benefits of the technology. I've already stressed kind of higher interoperability. Uh, that also often comes with lower barriers to entry and the ability of are kind of really reducing switching costs and lock-in for different market participants. Um, at its core, it's a technology that allows you to unbundle products and financial services that are currently bundled together in uh, institutions such as banks. Um, and also has a lot of potential on privacy. I think there's a number of new designs that when it comes to privacy, allow you to embed privacy principle uh, from the ground up. Um, it also comes with increased transparency and accountability. That can be a double-edged sword depending on how the technology is implemented. Now, a lot of this has, has kind of made it into the design of DM. Uh, DM, as you may know, is, is kind of a, a stable coin, uh, but something, and, and I don't have enough time to go into the details here that's worth highlighting is that, you know, stable coin is a bit of a misnomer. Uh, it's come to capture a number of different implementations uh, that have all sort of different risk when it comes to consumers transacting with this type of assets. At a very high level, our you know, stablecoin really kind of tracks uh, what's the relationship between a stablecoin and its reference assets, say the US dollar, whether it's completely not correlated, as in the case of crypto backed under collateralized stablecoins, or if it's perfect correlated, in, in which case it's likely to be something that looks a lot like a CBDC issued by the public sector. I think there's a spectrum of how reliable these tools can be. In, in achieving as a robust uh, payment and financial system. 
Now on the, on the DM front, you know, we incorporated some of the gold standards from the financial sector, think about the Basel III framework, and really trying to deliver on a payment tool and a payment network uh, that is highly reliable and can really withstand stress market conditions. But more important is our commitment to really phase out our own coin, think about a DM dollar, uh, the moment there is a public sector support at CBDC. And in that case, you know, essentially DM essentially just becomes a payment system on top of public sector rails. Uh, now, often people ask about the business model. The business model does not rely on interest on the reserve. So there's no point in, in kind of running the coin in the long run. And in fact, the coin will be replaced again with a public sector asset. Uh, it's a transactional network. And so the business model will rely on charging very small transaction fees uh, to its participants. Uh, now, because of programmability, of course, you could imagine slightly higher fees for added value transactions. Think about conditional payments, uh, which, by the way, are, are a big opportunity for government to citizen cash transfers in situations like the COVID recovery phase. <clears throat> when it comes to the network, uh, we moved away from proof of work. I mean, this has been kind of in the headlines in the last few weeks. A lot of concerns about the environmental impact of proof of work based networks. Uh, the reason actually why we did not choose proof of work beyond the environmental impact was also because proof of work does not really have the right types of incentives for uh, ensuring upgrades in the quality and availability of the service. And so DM is sort of a hybrid network where, you know, to some extent, we're relying on the off chain reputation of the initial members to run and secure uh, the validator nodes. And this is kind of where the association members come into the picture. Uh, they're there to drive utility and also secure the, the, the validators. Um, but over time, this is really not designed to be a wallet garden. Uh, model after the open technology standards of the internet, it forces interoperability between different wallets. So you know, users from a small wallet will benefit from access to the user base of a larger wallet, which much stronger network effects. Uh, the same is happening on the merchant side. So a merchant could choose to switch between different payment service providers and, and kind of retain all the functionality uh, of a pay with DM flow. Um, the idea is really to drive competition and, and to use that competitive force to lower prices, new products and services, uh, and really improvements in quality. Now, relative to existing stable coins, this is really a network that is optimized for payments. Uh, and we've made a number of changes from the early version of the white paper to really account for all of that. I won't go into too much detail, but I want to highlight a few kind of key questions. So why build a stable coin at all? Uh, well, you should think of this as a retrofitting exercise. We have slow, uh, expensive fiat rails or uh, payment systems like the card networks that have a number of legacy costs, including interchange. Uh, by retrofitting them with much faster, more efficient, interoperable digital rails, we can really accelerate progress on that dimension uh, and reduce really fragmentation in payments. And then of course, in the, in the medium term, there's programmability. And so there's a lot more you can do um, when, when you add conditional payments, escrow services, and, and, and other functionality on top of the network. What are we innovating on is really higher standards for consumer protection, the design of the reserve, and really figuring out a design that does not interfere with macroeconomic policy and financial stability. Some stable coins today actually talk about, you know, dollarization almost as a feature, as one of their, uh, you know, use cases. We don't think that that's kind of a sustainable one. And in fact, we want to work together with, you know, a number of uh, local governments in trying to find a way for the network to be accessible uh, without, you know, threatening, um, you know, currency substitution or other, or other kind of key risk. Uh, the, the other big area of innovation is robust financial crime and compliance standards. This is going to be the first network that not only would implement uh, sanctions uh, at the protocol level, but would also, uh, you know, adhere with things like the travel rule uh, and, and, and other measures to combat financial crimes. Now we think of DM very much as a complement to the public sector journey uh, towards CBDCs. Uh, some people have compared it to uh, the collaboration that you, you've seen, for example, in space between NASA and SpaceX. Um, but you know, if you look even at, at some of the documents coming out, for example, from the Bank of England, uh, in, in their discussion paper on central bank digital currency, they really stress that a CBDC without private sector involvement is unlikely to, to really meet their design principles. And this is something that, that we, we also really believe in um, as a driver of our real complementarities between you know, the public sector really building the core infrastructure and then the private sector driving innovation and use cases um, on top of it. So very high level, you know, what are some of the comparative advantages? Of course, the public sector, monetary policy, providing stability, preserving value. There's no point in having a stable coin 
if you do have a CBDC token, that's clearly superior and provides better consumer protection. Um, if you think of the public sector providing the core settlement layer, then on top of that, very much like the internet, you can have all sorts of additional protocols that take advantage of that and really customize that network for different verticals, industry verticals and different use cases. Um, now, a really important role for the public sector is also setting rules, uh, again, across those dimensions I was mentioning, like consumer protection, financial stability, competition market integrity, and, and also availability of the infrastructure under stress conditions. Um, forcing and, and, and really encouraging interoperability between different networks, right? So if you have a CBDC token, can it be used across many different networks that are competing with each other? Um, and on a global perspective, harmonizing legal frameworks. Uh, you know, for example, the work by the FSB on, on, on global stable coins has been extremely helpful, I think, in driving some degree of, of convergence on some of these topics. On the public sector side, this is where really, you know, being able to develop the consumer and business facing products and experiences it's one where the private sector can move much faster. Experimenting with programmability is also something that uh, probably a CBDC token may have a hard time given the risk involved um, and also really accelerating uh, time to market. Uh, so again, going back to the picture of the early internet, this is an era where public and private sectors are, are actually complements. And uh, I think building on the history, countries that are really interested in accelerating their journey uh, I think should should kind of explore these combinations. Uh, given that on the other hand, you do have kind of more permissionless cryptocurrency networks that do not provide some of the same protections and are still growing at, at a very fast rate. Uh, okay. So maybe I'll pause there. Two, two and more minutes. Forward to Just, uh, the, yeah, oh, perfect. I, I, you, I, you, okay, you're I'm ahead of time. Great, <laughs> thank you. So All right. looking forward to, to Daryl's comments. Thank you. Christian, yeah, thank you very much for the very interesting presentation. So let's go to uh, uh, Daryl Duffy. Good, uh, very early morning to you, Daryl. Thanks very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here, especially in front of this group, and especially to have the chance to, uh, uh, to discuss Christian's um, work, very important work at DM. He and I have had a lot of conversations about this over the past few years. I wanna, be, I wanna sharply focus my remarks on, on one theme, uh, because I, I see a lot of influencers in the audience and I wanna I want to influence them <laughs> with one question. Why can't banks do this? I'm, I'm going to try to make the case banks are perfectly positioned to do this, but they won't. It's not that they can't. And let me, let me get into this. So here's your prototypical payment situation. Alice needs to pay Bob the baker $8. How is she going to do it? Uh, well, for centuries, Alice sent a message to her bank saying, send the $8 out of my account, put it into Bob's account. Now, uh, today, from Alice's point of view, this is working fine. From Bob's point of view, it's not working at all well. Uh, he's paying a huge fee and he's getting the money slow. The system is not working well. And there are similar problems on the B2B side, so on the cross-border side, and in many other places. This diagram, there's nothing wrong with it. This wiring diagram works perfectly. Uh, Alice, if customer one of bank one can get the money to Bob, who's customer seven of bank three, uh, through the current uh, payment rails, in principle, at least according to this diagram, without difficulties and inexpensively. The technology exists today to do that, but it's not happening. Here is evidence of why it's not happening. Um, this is a bit complicated. It's from the McKinsey Global Payments Report, the latest one. It's a, a, a series of very useful reports. What I want you to take a look at is first the headline. The cost of payments in the US as far as the users go, that's payment revenues, is 2.4% of GDP. That is not a small number. And that's in North America. In Europe, Middle East and, and Africa, 1.3%. Uh, what accounts for that difference? Well, I, I can assure you it's not that North America has much, much better payments than Europe. It's simply that you're dealing with uh, in incentive issues with respect to um, uh, uh, margins and two-sided markets. So, for example, speaking of two-sided markets, uh, let's look at the credit card segment in the US. I'll just spend a little moment on that. 33% of the payment stack in North America is on consumer credit cards, 10% in mostly Europe. Why? Well, uh, because in North America, there's an enormous markup on the use of credit cards. Interchange fees are well above 
there's something uh, that's something that's not uh, working right in the US system. Now I'm gonna finish my remarks uh, with my diagnosis of the problem. The main problem is uh, that you have a situation in which the banks are capable technically of doing this, but they don't have the profit incentive to do it. And there are coordination failures. You have walled gardens, which Christian mentioned, and you have a Rocher to roll two-sided market situation in which the payment service providers face uh, consumers on one side and merchants on the other, and they have the opportunity uh, to stick it to the merchants in order to um, profit from them and give the consumers a relatively uh, painless and low cost experience. Why are central banks in most countries today in deep angst over letting uh, disruption occur in their payment systems? Whether they should let in FinTech payment service providers like Alipay and TenPay, let them have central bank accounts, uh, uh, encourage private stable coins like DM, or go to the nuclear option of introducing CBDCs. Most central banks do not want the responsibility for making these decisions. They do not want the responsibility for protecting data privacy, for doing anti-money laundering, KYC, and they definitely don't want to disrupt banks. They would love to have the banks just take care of this problem. Uh, gosh, I've got so much to say on this. Let me let me uh, repeat the ma the mantra that central banks keep saying when they say if they design a CBDC, they will do it without disrupting banks. I think that's a misunderstanding. Uh, it, the whole point is to disrupt banks. Uh, we need to disrupt banks in order to get proper payment services at, at, at reasonable prices. One of the reasons that central banks say they don't want to do this is that if they disrupt banks, then banks will not have a cheap deposit source of funding and therefore credit provision will go down. Let me repeat that. Uh, we're all economists. Do you really think that it makes sense that if banks are subsidized on the deposit side that they're going to make more loans? If you were at Chase and you had the opportunity to make a losing loan, would you do it because somebody on the deposit side said, go ahead, we're going to make profits over here in payments and deposits, you can go ahead and lose money on the loan side. No, it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense at all. Another reason that central banks say they don't want to do it is that they're worried about creating runs uh, for banks. I think that problem is uh, not as serious a problem as it's made out to be. So we're in this situation now where central banks have to uh, uh, come to grips with this very serious problem. If you, if you read Governor Brainerd's speech uh, uh, this week, uh, the Federal Reserve uh, Governor Leo Brainerd, uh, you'll see that eventually the United States is coming around to the view that it's gonna have to disrupt uh, banks and introduce a CBDC if the banks don't do it themselves. The banks have uh, a very profitable franchises and if they don't move quickly, they're going to uh, lose some of those. And I think you will see some movement, but I don't know how this, I don't know how to handicap this race. Let me finish by just a couple of remarks uh, on Christian's comments about um, moving to faster programmable uh, smart contract based uh, payment systems. The banks can do this as well. There's no reason that uh, bank deposits can't be tokenized and made into smart money. Uh, let's, let's be cautious about bifurcating the payment system into several chunks. That's not efficient. Uh, there's enormous network externalities, positive network externalities in payments and having everything run on one set of payment rails or, or as nearly as possible is actually a much more efficient way to do it. Let's also be cautious about what we do when we uh, make programmable money and smart contract settlement. There's a really good paper by Rob Townsend, uh, Michael Junho Lee and Antoine Martin uh, that draws some cautions and I'm actually working on, on this problem as well. Uh, there are unintended consequences of balkanizing um, payments and settlements by using uh, programmable money and smart contracts. Not that it can't work well, but it's, it, uh, it needs to be done thoughtfully and carefully. Read, read Rob's paper. It's also the case that when you split payment networks between private and central bank, uh, private stable coins, central bank uh, digital currencies and bank rail payments, that you are increasing the, the need for pre-funding each of those payment systems with liquidity. 
and the total amount of high quality liquid assets that need to be held in the form of a payment medium uh, uh, goes up a lot. Uh, so uh, let's be cautious about these potential unintended consequences of moving away from a bank rail payment system. Much better would be um, uh, somehow get the banks to do this, whether through regulation or incentives. Uh, uh, but I'm not optimistic that's going to happen. And uh, regulators and, this, and the and central banks need to get ready uh, to come in with their own central bank digital currencies, uh, if necessary, to get uh, to get movement in this area. So um, that's the end of my remarks. Thanks very much.